All right, guys, we're going to talk about a little bit more about nationalism here. And the unification of Germany is the most important event between like 1850 and 1950. It centers around the Prussian Prime Minister Otto von Bismarck, who is an old school Unker. All right, he likes the monarchy, he likes the nobility, and he likes the, the military. And his overall goal is not just to is not to unify Germany, but very similar to Count Camillo Cavour, he's trying to increase his and his king's power. And what enables him to do this is his diplomatic savvy, as he was the ambassador to Russia and France, his absolutely incredibly strong willpower, and his understanding of real politics, accomplishing what the state needs, not what it wants. And to him, Everything was fair game. So to distract his parliament's attention, he creates a series of wars, like a very intense, very savvy chess master. And he will help liberate two German-speaking states um, from Denmark. He will take one for Prussia and give the other territory to Austria, only a couple years later to turn on Austria. As the Austrian Habsburgs are defeated in the war with Napoleon III in France, Count Camillo Cavour in Piedmont and Sardinia, and Otto von Bismarck, a lot of provinces seek to join the German Confederation. They willingly join Bismarck's growing kingdom of Prussia. And Bismarck is doing all of this to eliminate an enemy that is France. He looked at that, the geographic position the German states have in Europe. On one side they have Russia, on the other side they have France, on the bottom they have the Austrian Habsburgs. So by defeating Austria, they've kind of learned their lesson. And, and Bismarck doesn't take all of their territory. He leaves some states in the south um, under um, Austria's control not to have to worry about them. So he's taught Austria a lesson, he's got France, and he's got Russia. And so when it comes to the Franco-Prussian War, it is France that is not very happy with the outcome of their alliance with Prussia. Prussia agreed to help France and Sardinia and the Piedmont fight against Austria. And the absolute ease with which the army of Prussia, the modern, well-trained, well-equipped army of Prussia defeated the Austrian Habsburgs scares the crap out of French Emperor Napoleon III. They were all at war, but it was Prussia who did all the, the damage. And there was a growing rivalry between France and Prussia. It was that old dispute of the old territory going back to the Treaty of Verdun and Charlemagne's grandsons in 843. And the rivalry is going to turn into a war in 1870. What happens is the war starts over the vacated Spanish throne. And the next in line to the King of Spain was a cousin of Kaiser or King William I. When Spain was um, going to get a new king that was of German ancestry, France protests. They've got Prussia on one side, Spain on the other. They felt boxed in by what was happening. So France immediately protested. They said they felt threatened and did not want to be boxed in between two German family members. So there is some negotiations, and the king of Prussia, Kaiser Wilhelm, and Napoleon III pretty much had an idea of what they were going um, to do. They talked about it peaceably, and they were going to resolve their differences. But Otto von Bismarck gives a key speech in Prussia. He brought up memories of the threat of the specter of Napoleon. You remember what Napoleon did. He almost conquered Europe not once, but twice. 
Be afraid of the French. Be afraid of their baseball bat hard bread. Be afraid of Fargois. Be proud of what is German. Be proud of Lederhosen and Sauerkraut and Beal and Glockenspiels. The French are hiding behind the border, just waiting to attack us again. And he speaks of German nationalism and superiority. And he said that countries are not made stronger by speeches and majority votes, but by blood and by irons, the famous blood and iron speech. This is what separates Germany from everybody else. Bismarck said, the German states need to form a strong, unified nation, and they do not need idle talk to decide its fate. They work at it. They go for it. Meanwhile, over in France, Napoleon III was having his own political and economic troubles at home. And there are negotiations between Napoleon III and King Wilhelm, as I said, as they try and work out a peaceful settlement. When Bismarck intercepts a message going from King William to Napoleon called the Ems Dispatch, he quickly, EMS Dispatch, he quickly edits it. And he changes the friendly, conciliatory, negotiating tone of Kaiser Wilhelm into one that insults France. Look, you French, pantaloon wearing, frog leg eating, pate loving, steak tartare eating Frenchies don't know anything. You got beat by yourself in your own civil war, and you technically claim you lose yourself. So you just step off and don't tell us what to do. We're German. And the polling the third, oh, disease. I refuse to do this. You have insulted French honor. No, no, no. We will go to war. And Napoleon III declares war. Once again, Bismarck made it look like somebody else's fault. He made it look like it was the French who wanted war and not himself. The vastly superior Prussian army hammers the French. And the French are forced to surrender. As a final example, or final insult rather to the French, the surrender document had to be signed in Versailles, long the seat of French power. And as Napoleon III comes into the Hall of Mirrors to sign the document, he sees King William, King Wilhelm I, sitting in his throne chair. Man, that's the French's king's chair. But he was forced to sign. Napoleon III signed the surrender to Germany. When that was done, all of the other states in Germany jumped to be part of a Prussian-led country now called Germany. So German nationalism is accomplished, much like Italy, by an old-school noble monarchist trying to increase his power that instead will unify the country. I will pick up there tomorrow, and we will talk about the Prussian Constitution and Habsburg-Austrian nationalism.